Jating tire anumo dama he vayam vivadamo natai sardham vivadang nibodhata. We approve the birthlessness that is revealed by them. We do not quarrel with them. O disciples, understand this philosophy that is free from dispute. By saying, let this be so, we simply anumodamahe approve the ajatim birthlessness. Taihi kyapyamanam argued by them, the followers of the Sankhya, as well as the Nyaya and the Visheshika systems. We, Navivadamaha, do not quarrel. Taisardam with them by taking any side for or against as they do in regard to each other. This is the idea. By finding fault with each other's views regarding causal relation, both schools tend to establish the truth of ajati, the absolute non-manifestation of atman. With regard to causality, we accept the theory that is not refuted by any party, but which must be admitted by all, ajati. Therefore, O disciples, nibodhata, understand that philosophy of the highest reality that is avivadam, beyond dispute, and is approved by us. Ajatas yaiva dharmasya jatim ichati vadinaha Ajato hyamrito dharmo martyatam katameshyati. The talkers verily vouch for the birth of an unborn positive entity. But how can a positive entity that is unborn and immortal undergo mortality? Alternate translation. The disputants, that is, the dualists, contend that the ever-unborn changeless entity, Atman, undergoes a change. How does a changeless and immortal entity partake of the nature of the mortal? This shloka is identical to Karika 320. Badinaha, the garrulous disputants who, in reality, do not know anything about Brahman, all of them, whether holding the view of the prior existence or non-existence of the effect, talking of Brahman while interpreting the Upanishads, Ichanti vouch for the Jatim birth, in a real sense, a Jatasya Eva, of the very same birthless one, the immortal reality that is the self. If the self be born as they hold, that is, creates itself into the manifold universe, it eshati martyatam certainly also will undergo mortality, for destruction is the inevitable consequence of all objects that are born. But that self, being by nature a bhavaha, positive entity that is ajata, unborn, and amritaha, deathless, katam, how can it undergo mortality? The idea is that it will in no way reverse its nature to embrace the mortality that individuals are subject to. Birth means change of nature. How can an entity be changeless while giving birth to other objects? Hence the theory that Atman somehow changes into the universe is fallacious. Namaste. Well, we're long overdue for some examples. <laughs> but I wanted to do the video on the quadrilemma first. 
because that's the background that enables you to understand this. Very few views means a lot of people won't get it. But you can look at it here. It really should go back if you didn't get it. Okay, so the quadrilemma of causality. Now, of course, the Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they say the existent, or God, is true. And the effect is also true, the material world, which puts God and the material world on the same level, effectively making God a part of the world, which is not very desirable. Then you have the Sankhya and the Vedas saying that the cause, Brahman, is real or true, existent, and the world is false. It's Maya, doesn't exist. Then you have the Vaisheshikas, which are like the atomists or materialists, like the scientists, the empirical scientists. They say the effect is real, the world is real, but it came out of a non-existent cause. Well, what do you mean a non-existent cause? Well, what's the cause of the Big Bang? Uh, they can't say. And finally, you have Buddhism, which is like far out in left field with its extreme idealistic views of a non-existent cause giving rise to a non-existent false world. Now, if you had to bet on any of these... <laughs> The only ones worth betting on are the ones that say the material world is false. Why? Because it's demonstrably false. Things are temporary. They're unsatisfactory. And they're different from the self. That's why we perceive them. So if anything can be perceived, that means it's not real. Because it's different from the self. The self is the only real thing. Everything else is simply derivative. But then how does that derivation take place? Does the self turn itself into the material world somehow? Is there a process of transformation? Or does the self give birth to a second self? Or does the self somehow become material? or involved with the material, or imagine the material, dream it, or, you know, there are so many different explanations. But they all put a predicate on the self. Look at the diagram again. The cause is called the subject, and the effect is called the predicate. I read the book. Huh? I am the subject, I'm the doer, and my action is to read the book, the object, the book. I watch the video. Huh? The same thing. All simple sentences and complex sentences are based on the idea of doer, action, and object. The trinity of ontological truth. Huh? But it only is true in words. It's only logically true. It's not necessarily experientially true. What is experientially true is that we seem to witness cause and effect in the world. So if cause and effect is in the world, that means it's also intrinsic to the cause, Brahma. So somehow cause and effect, time, materiality, all these things are latent in Brahman and they just come out at the time of creation. But this doesn't work either, because then it means Brahman has qualities. And anything that predicates Brahman is out of luck, because Brahman is without relationship to anything else. Try to understand. One without a second means Brahman is in a class by itself. It doesn't have any relation, doesn't have anything to do with anything else. So Brahman can't be the cause of the material world. That's why some philosophies say that, well, actually, Brahman isn't the cause, but Maya is the cause. That means, you know, A plus C somehow produces B, uh, like we discussed in the last video. But this is not satisfactory either, because, again, it puts Brahman as a subject and 
attaches a predicate to it. Brahman becomes a doer. Brahman becomes a haver of qualities, whether they're, you know, latent or expressed. It doesn't make any difference. Brahman still has to become qualitative, so that doesn't work either, see? So you can go through all these quadrilemma, these different explanations of how the world comes into being. And you'll find that none of them are satisfactory, but it's hard to name the reason why. The reason is that Brahman can never be attached to a predicate. Got it? <laughs> so, like, you can't say Brahman created the universe. Well, you could say it, but it's just words. It's a misapplication of the principle of causality to a subject that has no causality because it has no qualities. That's Brahman, and it has no actions. So it can't do anything. It can't cause something because causing is an action. And finally, it can't have a predicate because it doesn't exist in the sense of a material thing that a word can attach to, name and form. So unless it has a material form, we can't attach a word to it. We can't make a predicate for it. So, I mean, we can, but it's false. So Brahman is that which is, as the Upanishad says way back in the first chapter, not related to anything, causeless, never becomes an object, is not conscious of anything. Because it's not conscious. It's only fully self-aware. And itself is everything. Obviously, all of this is on the platform of a jatavada, which means Turiya consciousness, which means it's accessible only to those who are already self-realized. So if you're not self-realized, it sounds like we're talking gibberish. But it's a matter of experience to those who are. So, do your sadhana. <laughs> it's worth it in the end. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.